Uh, welcome to this group discussion on Eastern Christian Studies uh, as taught in the Department of Eastern Christian Studies uh, at St. Ignatius College and EOS. And we welcome to this discussion Professor Samuel Rubinson, who's Professor of Eastern Christian Studies uh, yep. and has many years of research in, in various topics, but the one I know you for best, sir, is really your work with the Desert Fathers and spirituality and um, and that. Would you like just to say something briefly about your own um, outlook or experience or research priorities? Yeah, I grew up in Ethiopia, and so I experienced in my childhood and my <clears throat> early education the Ethiopian Orthodox culture in general, but also the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and its services, and that intrigued me since I was uh, raised as a Protestant Christian. And so I decided to try to understand what is common and why there are differences between Christians. And when I came to Egypt to look for the roots of Oriental Christianity, I came to visit the monasteries in the Egyptian desert and understood that uh, the monastic tradition is essential if you want to understand the basic characteristics of a Christian tradition, whether an Eastern or a Western, because monasticism has been the place where the tradition has developed, uh, things have been written, education has been going on and so on. Now that's briefly my background and I'm still working on the same issues. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And uh, also Dr. Barsomi, is that how you say yeah. your second name? I've always known he was Gabriel, I'm afraid. Yeah. Barsome. <laughs> Barsome. Barsome. Yeah. Barsome, okay. And uh, Gabriel, you're a senior lecturer, I think, in the Department of Eastern Christian Studies. And you're Deputy Dean of St. Ignatius as well. Can you just briefly introduce your own experience mm -hmm. in research interests and teaching? Yeah. Uh, I grew up also not in Ethiopia. I grew up in Sweden, was born here, but to parents uh, belonging to the Syriac Orthodox tradition. So I have a personal history within the Orthodox Church and uh, also being the son of an uh, Orthodox priest, I grew up with the church very intensively, both in its liturgical setting and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So growing up, I was uh, my interest grew towards the, the liturgy of the church day-to-day -day, you know life i participated but also you know later on my research interest uh, went into uh, uh, basically to studying the liturgy and its development and uh, uh, you know i was curious about why we did we did things in this in the ways that we were doing them and what they actually could mean or how one could make sense of the liturgy once uh, so i wrote my dissertation uh, in uh, uh, on the Syriac Orthodox liturgy and especially its development during the uh, early Middle Ages towards the, the 12th century and so on. Yeah. And that's part of my interest still today. And what, what do you teach in the, in the courses at EOS? Oh, I teach uh, different uh, things. <laughs> uh, currently, for example, this semester I was teaching a course in Eastern Christian Ecclesiology and history of religions together with a different um, teacher also. So that's just two of the courses that I'm teaching. Oh, okay, thank you. And Dr. Grant White, we welcome you as well. You're in snowy Finland today. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Hugh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, I grew up in central Kansas in the United States, which might not seem like exactly uh, fertile ground for an interest in Eastern Christian studies, but actually, I grew up in a small town that had a Presbyterian four-year college that offered the bachelor's degree with a fantastic collection in uh, liturgical studies. It must have been founded by high church Presbyterians in the 1880s, and one day, I went in the library and ran across Frank Brightman's Liturgies Eastern and Western, volume one, which is the only volume that was published on Eastern liturgies. And I was hooked. It's that simple. And uh, after that, I focused on liturgical studies, first in university and 
then um, I got a degree in liturgical studies at Notre Dame and got the chance to study um, a while at Oxford as well. Again, all in the area of um, liturgy, but also related subjects, history of theology, as well as um, history of Christian asceticism. And so what I ended up writing on, actually, is on an obscure, probably early 5th century church document um, called the Testament of Our Lord, where uh, the disciples asked Jesus after his resurrection, Lord, what is the church supposed to be like? And he opens his mouth and out comes this detailed plan for how the church ought to be governed, how it ought to worship, how it ought to even build its own buildings. And um, I focused on daily prayer and its connections with ascetic prayer and ascetic terminology in the late 4th and early 5th centuries. And so uh, I teach largely courses in liturgy, Eastern Christian liturgy here, but also uh, I do things like direct, uh, help direct uh, the bachelor's and master's thesis seminars and uh, whatever else uh, people need me to do. Great, thank you very much indeed. Okay, I have a question for uh, you all to, to discuss. And the first one, really, the most obvious one is what is Eastern Christian studies? Or what, maybe the verb should be are, what are Eastern Christian studies? But as a subject, what, what's the difference between Eastern Christian studies and what is typically taught in a theology department or a religious studies department in a European or a North American university? Who wants to kick off offering a definition? I could do that since I wrote the definition earlier. <laughs> Eastern Christian studies is simply the study of uh, Eastern Christianity that is both Byzantine and uh, Oriental, both uh, Chalcedonian and pre-Chalcedonian, with the same tools, methods, uh, and uh, perspectives as people do Western Christianity. And a reason to have Eastern Christian studies is simply that theological and religious studies at the universities in Europe and the States tend to be not only focused on and uh, working with Western Christianity, but also defined by the characteristics of, uh, I would say, primarily Protestant tradition, which means that you divide religious studies and theology into certain subjects that do not really fit Eastern Christianity. So in order to really reveal the history, the life, the workings, the present of Eastern Christianity, you need to have a system of studies that has a basic understanding that is rooted in these traditions. Um, we are so... Uh, defined by Western Christianity that we don't realize that Eastern Christianity is rather different and needs to be taken on its own terms. Maybe I could say something. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, <clears throat> psalm read. Like when, I, when I studied uh, theology, let's say, uh, my first my undergraduate degree and then my graduate and then went on, like you said, my experience was you studied it was a very Eurocentric perspective. So, and you, you, even though you did touch upon, you know, Eastern churches up until the split between East and West Rome, you did study, you, you were aware, you were taught that there are some Christians, you know, East of Rome in the Byzantine Empire, they do Greek and, you know, maybe a sentence or two about uh, what's going on in India and what's going on in Egypt and Ethiopia and Eritrea. But then it would stop. Uh, and whatever you touched was up until the fifth, sixth centuries, nothing more beyond that. Uh, and then you you get into the this whole, you know, the study of theology, you know, depending on what subject you are in, obviously. But it's the historical theology and how theology develops during the scholastic period in the Middle Ages and and where it's biblical science, then it's you know very affected by all of those. Uh, uh, tools that were developed in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. The first time I actually did uh, I encounter in, in, you know, more deeply uh, Eastern Christianity was when I studied, um, in, this was in Princeton in the U.S. So it was one of the few places where actually some of the professors 
uh, had studied, they were experts in Eastern Christianity, in Syria Christianity, and also in Ethiopian Christianity. They had some uh, deeper knowledge and also about, about in Byzantine the churches as well. So that was the first time I actually experienced, but it was still focused on the Protestant churches and, and, and on, on Europe. But it was the first time that I actually encountered, okay, there's something, we know there's something beyond that, but what are the sources? Uh, what's the history? Uh, how can we approach, you know, this kind of theology with what, you know, how can we understand it? So uh, I agree, therefore, just to say that, you know, there's no other place or there are a few other places where you can study this kind of stuff. And I don't think that uh, uh, the study of Christianity would be complete without all these perspectives. Thank you, Grant. Do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well... I'm kind of at a loss to add too much to what my colleagues have already said here. I think I'll just add a slightly different perspective, and that is my uh, my background um, in ecumenical uh, teaching settings in uh, in England, in uh, Finland, and uh, and also to a lesser extent in the United States, where again, by and large, um, Eastern Christians, whether Chalcedonian or as Samuel says pre-Chalcedonian. Uh, tend to be marginalized in the discussion, in the contemporary ecumenical discussion even. And so um, there's a lot of scope there, I think, for um, making our understanding, our common understanding of what Christianity is, more Catholic, with a small c, that is, to, to realize that uh, Catholic nature of, of the church itself. And... Um, you know, you, there's ecumenical value in this as well. I, for example, um, after I got my doctorate, the first place I taught was a United Methodist seminary in the United States. And, you know, uh, you really can't understand the Wesley brothers' teaching on Christian perfection unless you uh, understand how they read uh, some of the Cappadocian fathers, particularly St. Gregory of Nyssa. And how John Wesley read the Macarian literature, and they, he knew him as Macarius of Egypt. Of course, we know that's not true, but the point is, he read the Macarian literature and was deeply inspired by it, by that notion of, of the, um, the sensation of the spirits working in the heart. And so um, there's a, a definite uh, connection there that, um, that we need to make clear and to, to help today, I think with a greater understanding and appreciation of each other's traditions. And so, um, you know, if we don't have Eastern Christian studies, and particularly a place where it's at the center, then uh, we lose that chance to contribute, I think. And to add to that, <clears throat> we tend to look at uh, early Christian uh, text, our common text, only on the basis of Greek and Latin manuscripts mm -hmm. and translations. Mm -hmm. The translations of Macarius and other important uh, church fathers into Ethiopic and Arabic are, and Syriac are neglected, but they are mm -hmm. part of our common heritage. That's right. That, that's very helpful and leads really to my second question, which you've partially answered anyway, which is, um, what does the study of Eastern Christian studies bring to the experience of the wider church why do we need to know i mean it might be interesting you might have a personal interest in in the syriac church or the uh, chuhido tradition but is is there a sense in which neglecting these traditions has impoverished our wider christian experience and can you maybe pinpoint something that you think the wider church the global church can learn from those uh, experiences, theology, spirituality, and liturgies of the Eastern churches? I think it's obvious that there are at least two things that have been neglected in uh, the Western Christian uh, uh, history of theology and ideas. One problem, and because of the conflicts, especially around the Reformation, one thing is that we have tended to focus on theology in the meaning, trying to debate and discuss uh, what God is and what God wants and how God acts and uh, how different um, rituals have effects. 
and neglected the anthropology, the understanding of, of man as created in the image of God in order to uh, <coughs> be uh, made like God, the likeness. These issues, whereas the Eastern Christianity has tended to have a much greater focus on, on anthropological issues, starting with man rather than with God. And the other is the environment where we are in a climate crisis, where I think also Eastern Christianity has had a much greater appreciation for the fact that the entire creation is not only the work of God, but also the word of God. Uh, so I think uh, these are aspects that are, are needed in Western Christianity. But then in addition, of course, it's, it's a part of our heritage. If you only uh, have part of the heritage and neglect its fullness, uh, there is a great risk of being one-sidedness. And then add, to add to that, I think that Eastern Christianity has had a relation both to Judaism and Islam that is helpful in the modern um, issues of the relation between the churches in general and other traditions. Thank you very much. Do either of our other two um, participants have anything to add to that? You can go ahead. Go ahead. No, thank you, Gabriel. Just a couple of quick things, just to, to build on what Samuel has said. Um, as far as um, the environment goes, um, and its relation to theological anthropology, you know, there's um, there's the entire question of embodiment in Eastern Christian practices, yeah. and uh, broadly speaking, the practice of Eastern Christianity, Eastern Christian traditions, that um, that I think there is much to learn from um, in the wider church. Uh, I'm I'm always um, hesitant to to say what others ought to learn from me. You know what I mean. <laughs> I'm more interested in um, in trying to find places where we can build connections, at least. But I think certainly with the the issue of the the body itself and its relation to the to the cosmos, which of course has a has a dramatic effect upon how Eastern Christian traditions look at not only liturgy but the entire world itself. And uh, tied to that then would be the, uh, the question of, and there's no good word for this, I'm afraid, uh, spirituality. I know for some um, Orthodox uh, folk, particularly in the United States, spirituality is a four-letter word. Why? Because it, it conjures up these notions of new agey things. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about um, how Eastern Christian traditions have approached the question of, the relationships between the human person, God, and the world, and um, and the um, ultimate um, goal of of humanity and the entire created cosmos um, in God's design, and how um, our very concrete everyday lives um, reflect that journey, that um, that growth um, into the likeness of God after having been created in God's image. And, uh, you know, when, when there's so much interest these days in spirituality, right, and across the board, um, around the world, I think that, um, that Eastern Christian traditions have, have a neglected set of, um, of practices, texts, understandings that, um, that would be good to um, find a greater um, voice within uh, the Christian world. And from my perspective, uh, uh, I would say that, you know, I see it as from a perspective of complementarity. So mm -hmm. without studying Eastern Christianity, it would, it would be incomplete uh, view of uh, what the Christian heritage is, uh, like Samuel already mentioned. Um, but also many of the issues and problems that appear in one Christian tradition uh, might have a solution sometimes in other in other parts of the Christian tradition. For example, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, or more than a couple of years ago, uh, there was a lecture given by um, Professor Ivana Noble, where there was this debate about uh, the, you know, the Orthodox theologians of the 20th century who are very cr critical of, uh, you know, the development of Western, Western Christianity and in the West in general, this entire critique. 
And then, you know, she said something like, you know, our clericalism is your clericalism. Our, this issue is your issue. So there is mm -hmm. this in, in the conversation between mm -hmm. uh, East and West, if I may say so, uh, there are both, uh, you know, uh, points of recognition and also points where we can uh, uh, find solutions to our own thinking, to our own thoughts, our own problems, uh, so to speak, I think. Thank you. Um, I wonder if um, each of you can give, provide one writer or text or um, something you've discovered that means something to you, particularly from the Eastern Christian tradition. I'm sure there are many. Um, we could be here for a very long time discussing all the things that you have been impressed by. But I wonder if each of you could just think of one thing or one writer or one, um, yeah, one discovery that has meant something to you from your journeys of research and teaching. Anybody want to kick off on that one? That's, of course, very hard because I can easily come up with 20, 20 <laughs> or 50 names. And uh, one thing that uh, has been very important in the long run and as a kind of, of thought throughout uh, many years and decades is uh, the, the reception of uh, the great thinkers of early Christianity, uh, in particular, in my case, Origen and Evagrius, who are, of course, known also to Western Christianity, but it's clear that the treatment of these has been very different. You know, both were called in question by the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine Church uh, for their, uh, you could say, freedom in thinking and their focus on uh, the personal development of the Christian. And I think that it's been extremely helpful to think of origins treatment of biblical texts as received and used in Eastern Christianity. And I think here, especially of Ethiopian Christianity as a kind of counterweight to Protestant fundamentalism, where it's clear that it's a much richer understanding of what the Bible means in the life of a Christian and uh, with the roots back to origin that because of the dogmatic conflict in the West has not been observed to the same extent. And for Evagrius, his emphasis on how to deal with your personal problems, a kind of, you could say, uh, religious psychology that has been used in the Eastern monastic tradition by elders and, and providing help for people trying to, to help themselves and their problems that has also been totally neglected in the more rigorous idea of the West of uh, finding faults and uh, having uh, judgments and uh, ways of penance instead of treating the ill. Mm. These are two things. Thank you. Yeah, uh, for, yeah for me, uh, I, would, I wouldn't say Maybe I also have authors, but I would say a practice is uh, um, an important part for me. And uh, the study of a practice, namely the liturgy, the embodiment of the liturgy, and all the liturgical texts that you encounter as you, I mean, as you both you as you participate, but also as uh, as you study the the liturgy. And, and in addition to this, I would say, uh, and for me, just to say before I go into that, is the the entire cycle of the liturgical year and how. Uh, you know, the divine liturgy in all its uh, fullness and all its cycle and how it makes, how it, in, in one sense, it enmeshes the entire uh, life of the human being and how it takes into account, you know, seasons, how it takes into account uh, uh, not only seasons in nature, but also seasons in life. Uh, the entire ritual system in that sense is, you know, very full and rich and it's very interesting to study it and, you know, it's beautiful also. Uh, the beauty of the liturgy is something that uh, you know draws me back uh, uh, again and again. And on that note, I would say that probably one of my favorite authors in uh, in the East uh, is Ephraim the Syrian, and that has to do with 
his uh, beautiful poetry that he wrote and uh, you know in the midst of you know i will talk about this a bit more in in in, in a bit but in the midst of his life you know he ac actually experienced having to be dislocated from where he was born uh, due to you know historical situation where where Nisibis was taken over or was in a tree, was taken over by the Persian Empire from the Roman Empire, having to move first to uh, Amida, so the Arbaker, today's Turkey, and then further on to Edessa and died serving, according to his biography, uh, serving to the sick. So in the midst of war, in the midst of disease and sickness, you know, the toughness and ugliness of life, he was able still to uh, write beautiful poems. Uh, beauty was important to him. And this beauty was uh, became and is still a fundamental part of uh, the liturgical tradition. Uh, so, yeah. Grant, can you think of something or someone? Oh, I just have to echo what Samuel has already said. I could talk a long time about uh, this in terms of my own journey, particularly. Uh, I'd have to say, you know, the, again, the work of Evagrius, and particularly the Practicos, as um, the first volume of, of uh, his great um, trilogy, if you were, of uh, of spiritual wisdom. That um, just returning to it again and again and again to see exactly how he he analyzes um, the life of the heart, and it's it's something that that is very concrete, um, extremely practical and which uh, has had such an enormous impact and continues to. Uh, that would be one. Um, Gabriel, you just uh, you just said what I was going to say in my presentation in the next session. So um, I could talk about that for sure. Um, I think, though, I think a, another place would go, since you said it so well, is to, to go instead to a, a modern, uh, literally a 20th century Orthodox author, he went by the name of a monk of the Eastern Church. Um, his name in the world was uh, Lev Gillet, G-I-L-L-E-T. And uh, is one of the great unappreciated, I think, um, Eastern Orthodox theologians of the 20th century. And uh, in his own work um, in putting forth a, uh, a life in Christ that's modern and also deeply rooted in um, in the tradition of the church and, and scholarship at the same time has uh, been deeply inspirational for me and also simply the way that he uh, he lived a, a humble life he could have been a really made his mark in the world of scholarship he chose to live a different life and an impactful life and uh, an influence that uh, not not only was felt in the west but also um, in other parts of the world, um, his work in uh, in uh, Lebanon, for example, with uh, with uh, Orthodox youth, you know, continues to have an impact today. Uh, one of his one of his own students, uh, Metropolitan George Koder, um, you know, continues uh, his work in some significant ways in looking at um, Christian Muslim dialogue, for example, or the work of the Holy Spirit in the world today. So, uh, you know, I, I return to these authors again and again and uh, continue to find my own inspiration in them. Thank you very much. Um, you've already mentioned the relation of Eastern Christian studies to the Eastern churches, and we identify them and think of them as Orthodox churches. The Ethiopian and Eritrean Orthodox churches, the Syrian Orthodox church, the various kinds of Byzantine Orthodox church. Would people who are coming here today to, to look and to try and understand what they might study, is it necessary to be a member of an Orthodox church to study Eastern Christian studies? Or is it something that's more accessible than that? That's an open question to any of you who wants to answer could start again. I'm not a member of any Orthodox Church. I'm, I'm a Lutheran and I'm an, even a minister in the Lutheran uh, Church of Sweden. So oh, it's obviously not necessary uh, to study, to do research 
and even to become professor of Eastern Christian studies without being belonging to one of the churches. <clears throat> and I don't think it is necessary to really understand, but what is necessary is of course that you actually uh, dive into the Orthodox world and, and share the experiences. It's not just by reading statements, but you also have to, to understand how uh, things are done, the bodily language, uh, you have to participate, but you ha don't have to be formally a member, I'm, I'm confident. I just yeah, add I my, nothing to, I add nothing to add to that. Yeah, I would just add my amen to that. So the programs we offer are not just for Orthodox students, although there are students, of course, who are Orthodox and are training some of them uh, for priesthood or other kinds of service within the Orthodox churches. What do you think the challenges would be for students? Are there, are there things that you think they might find particularly difficult entering into this area of studies? I think uh, languages are one difficulty. If you are not, you don't have the language. It takes time to learn a language to find the nuances, uh, to really work with text in a foreign language. And language is not just the, the system of words, but it's also the culture. So actually, I think that without being willing to really share the, the life, the attitudes, the languages of Eastern Christianity, you will find it difficult to really enter into the uh, the complex issues and really see the, the hidden connections. So I, I think the difficulty is that you have to dare to go outside of your own culture and language. Um, but if you're willing to that, a world will open up to you. Yeah, and it's not only one language. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, yeah, also adds to the complexity and nobody can know all the languages. Maybe some can know, you can learn a lot of the language, but still, uh, you know, any scholar will, will at, at depend on some kind of translation at some point. But if you want to go deeper into it, I agree that you need to know language. Syriac, it's Arabic, it's uh, Ge'ez, it's uh, Greek, it's so many different languages. And they're difficult to learn also, Hebrew. But it's, it's very important to know, if you think of this, that it's actually the first five, six languages that are difficult. The more languages you learn, the easier it becomes. Yeah. That's very, we it's, it's, it's only the first five or six that are difficult. That's good. Yeah. We need to inscribe that over the entrance to yeah. Sankt Ignatius's offices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you I, think, just, sorry, Grant, carry on. No, 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 I, I just, uh, would uh, say the same thing about the languages and and also just about going out of yourself and and being willing to encounter um another culture uh, another tradition and you know in my experience it takes knowing oneself to be able to do that and so um you know there's a process of personal uh, development involved as well i think and, and I, on that note on personal development, I think that it's by, by reading biblical texts in several of the Oriental languages has opened my eyes to things that I wouldn't see if I only read the Swedish or English version. And it's the same actually goes for, for other material that hasn't been translated. It is the process of translating things into your own language mm. really, helps you to develop your own language, your own thinking. My ability to write good Swedish has actually improved by working on attempts to translate. Because when you translate, you're really forced to think, how could you express this thought in a mm. language that is not equivalent? Because no mm. languages are equivalent. You can't just mm. translate one word into the the word of Swedish, because every word has its context, its life, its psychology and everything. So you really develop your own thinking. You, you become a, 
a richer person by working with many languages. Thank you. You've, you've mentioned the, the, the languages as being perhaps the most challenging aspect of studying Eastern Christian studies, because these are largely unfamiliar languages to most people in, in Europe. Um, I remember from my own studies, Latin was taught in my school and Greek was only for maybe one or two specialists. Um, but we're talking about other languages largely unfamiliar to Western European audiences. But I'm just, I think some people who are watching this now might be interested in studying for the bachelor's degree. And I'm just wondering, is that something you can only complete successfully by learning other languages or is it possible at that level to um, to have only the English or the Swedish uh, that's necessary. Who who could help me with that one? I can say something. Yeah. Um, at the bachelor level, I think it's not necessary. All the text and material that you have in the coursework is uh, is in English mostly. The, everything is not not mostly. It, it is in English. Uh, so English is the necessary language to be able to complete because everything, even if when you encounter uh, at the, at that level, uh, the texts, the original texts, we will, will encounter them in not in, tra in translation. I mean, it's only when you want to move fo forward and further and go into more advanced studies in the second and then after research that you it will be necessary because at the bachelor level it's an introduction. Basically, the entire third three years at the bachelor level is an introduction to the field, and for that uh, the languages are not they're helpful if you know them, but it's not necessary. Yeah, I would say. I agree, and you can you can learn and you can take your exam, but if you really want to understand, it's better to start with the languages early. So if you know that you are really interested in, in delving deeper and have a broader understanding and not simply what is necessary, then it's good to start with the languages early, but it's not strictly necessary, that's true. And just to add one small thing to that, you know, we're really fortunate at Sankt Ignatius that there um, is such a range of Eastern Christian languages offered. Yeah. And so um, this is a unique place to do that, really. There aren't many places anywhere where you can do that. Yeah. So take the chance. <laughs> okay, thank you all. I've, I've finished my list of questions. I'll just leave it open, really, if there is something briefly each of you would like to add or, or not, if not. I would just echo what Samuel said. Take the chance. Yeah. Come and study with us. Uh, I think and there, one could perhaps also add that uh, many of the Eastern Christian churches and traditions have lived uh, for centuries uh, under pressure from uh, uh, other religious traditions or political systems and have had experiences of, uh, of suffering uh, that uh, we have as Western Christians not seen the same. And I think these experiences are actually important to to deal with and and take into consideration but it's also a matter of actually uh, handing back some of the privileges that we have had uh, some of these churches and traditions need help with their education with their development with their situation politically and so on and we who have the chance to do something and, and assist should really also think of doing that. So I would say studying Eastern Christian studies is also a way to, to hand back some of the privileges that we have had and to work for a better future for the world. And I would just add that, you know, studying Eastern Christian, the Eastern Christian churches means studying churches that have historically their roots in the Middle East, in, uh, in Africa and in, in Asia uh, and so on. So, and a lot of the things that are happening in the world right now are taking place in these very important parts of the world. And I would say that, you know, in order to 
have a fuller and better understanding of the word. I believe that studying the Eastern churches uh, will be a tool in which you can actually, you know, learn more about what's going on and try, and you will also understand, you know, one of the things that we study in Eastern Christian ecclesiology, the course that I taught, is the interaction between church and state and how it has developed historically and also today in the Eastern churches. And that becomes an important part. How can we understand that? How can we, by studying the Eastern churches, how can we also understand what's going on in the world today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that very quickly, the more people who have that knowledge, the better off we are. Yep. And so even if you, uh, you know, even if you're not thinking and maybe even primarily not thinking of something related to a, a religious community, um, this knowledge uh, is extremely valuable and useful in a variety of different areas. Great. Well, thank you all very much indeed. So I'll bring this discussion uh, to a close and encourage uh, anyone who's watching this to, um, to find out more and to, um, if necessary, come and visit us, uh, talk to somebody who teaches here. We're very happy to spend time helping. And we hope you are encouraged to apply and come and study Eastern Christian studies at St. Ignatius College and EOS. Thank you very Thank much.